Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased that you're able to join us today. I know that uh, this is a part of our continuing series on COVID-19 workplace safety. And as I've shared before, our goal is really to help businesses get open and stay open and make sure that working people can work and businesses can continue to operate within the state of Michigan. And we know that in the face of COVID, there are a lot of challenges to that. And I'm pretty excited today that we're gonna focus in on a very important topic, especially as we get beyond summer, although the weather's hanging on a little bit for us and start moving toward that indoor fall and winter time that we have to endure here in Michigan. I know uh, that that brings some other challenges to the table. And one of the things we've been talking about all along throughout this crisis is to just keep in mind how it spreads. The uh, science has been pretty static about some of these key points is that it's primarily transmitted through large respiratory droplets and aerosols that we create when we talk, sneeze, cough, or sing or, or do other things that we're expelling from our bodies. And about 40% or so of the spread of this is coming from folks that are asymptomatic and another percentage from those that are pre-symptomatic. So these are folks that are out and about and feel fine that are potentially transmitting this virus. And that's why it's so critical that we continue to maintain those things uh, like good hygiene, making sure we wash because as the virus falls, it's on it's on things that we may touch and contaminate ourselves if we touch our eyes, nose or mouth. That we practice that social distancing to give the virus time to either fall to the ground or if we're outdoors, dissipate into the fresh air. And to wear those face coverings when we're either indoors, we can't maintain that social distance or otherwise to ensure that we're keeping the virus as close to us as possible and minimizing those large respiratory droplets and aerosols that we're creating, which are why those uh, requirements and guidelines are so critical. So we're gonna talk a lot about that today and we're gonna talk mostly about indoor spaces in HVAC. I'm very pleased to have Sonia Pouncey on behalf of ASHRAE, who are the experts in this space, as well as Todd Parker, the Director of Programs for Michigan Saves to share information with you about steps that you can take to help reduce or mitigate the hazard in indoor environments. Now, I want to, you to keep in mind that this can reduce, or if you don't do anything and have stale stagnant air indoors, it may contribute to the transmission of the virus. This is part of an overall mitigation strategy. These tools alone may or may not be enough to get that virus out of there completely. So you still need to couple it with those sign postings, limitation sizes, wearing masks and otherwise. And uh, Sonia will go into more detail on what these strategies we're gonna share today can do. And also keep in mind that th we're talking about general ventilation. So this isn't like source ventilation controls where we're gonna stick an exhaust duct right over top of whatever's creating a hazard. This is about how your general ventilation is gonna impact the environment and the ability of the virus to be transmitted. This is the start of a four part series. So today is gonna to be more general. And then we're gonna have follow up webinars on ventilation specifically, uh, filtration specifically and humidification that uh, Sonia can uh, jump on a little bit more. There is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit questions as we go through. We will get to as many as we can at the end. And as you're watching today, I just wanna tell you, don't get overwhelmed. Sonia is going to tell you these are systems. There's a lot going on here. It's complex. That is true, but there are small steps that you can take. So don't let yourself get overwhelmed by the information that we're going to share. And make sure that you continue to check out our Michigan.gov COVID workplace safety websites for posters, videos, guidelines for industries and other things that you, you need to be doing in your workplaces. The information we're talking about today are not guidelines. This is best practice and things that you can do to help mitigate this risk but the other information is available at that website. Use that hotline at 855-SAFE-C19 into MyOSHA if you need or have questions about the workplace as it relates to COVID. The wait time is about 20 seconds and the average call is about five minutes. This gets you right to the experts on that, so make sure you take advantage of it. We have links to other great information there that I wanna remind you, don't forget to check out that Pure Michigan Business Connect platform can help you find PPE, sanitizer, and other needs. The My Symptoms app can help you do the health screenings that you need to conduct every day before your employees come into work. And there's other tools there on the Safe Start site and the Mask Up Michigan program. 
I'm very pleased to introduce Sonia Pouncey today, who is joining us on behalf of ASHRAE to kind of talk through some of these things that we can do indoors to help us reduce the transmission of COVID. Sonia? If you're talking, Sonia, we can't hear you yet. So to uh, kill some of the dead space that we have right now, I think we're having a little technical difficulty with Sonia. We'll get her on as quickly as we can. She's going to be with us today from uh, the ASHRAE Michigan chapter and, and share a lot of good information with us. Uh, I will try to run through a couple of her first slides to just try to help out and keep us moving along. But as we get more detailed, we'll certainly want to make sure we swap over to Sonia, but uh, just first and foremost, the ASHRAE group, and we're going to talk about some of the information that they've put together, but it's uh, have, you know, this isn't perfect. The science is developing. They're continuing to follow it, and they've put this information to get together to help us and help you uh, make sure you understand how these systems work and things that you may be able to do. There's a lot of complexity that goes into these systems. And as science changes, as executive order requirements change, this information may change. As I mentioned, this is a continuation of our uh, the first part of our series of webinars we're going to be having. The first one today, of course, is going to be our overview of all of these systems together, but then we really want to focus in on those things like uh, on October 8th, it's going to be ventilation and maintenance of those ventilation systems. The 22nd, we're planning filtration, and then on the 5th, we're planning the humidification, and all of these things have an impact of how well uh, we can contain COVID in the workplace and indoors. So uh, make sure you check back in to uh, get more detailed pieces about those components of your systems. So ASHRAE has been around for a very long time. Uh, it's the American Society of Heating, Refrigerated, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And these are the folks uh, that put together a lot of different information and research and standards that are used across industries to make sure that all of those system components are doing the things that they need to be doing. This might be as simple as some of the building codes that you're used to maybe dealing with, as well as those more advanced tools and technologies that would be used in something like a hospital setting. This is the group that really focuses in to make that happen and make it a success. Just as an example, some of what they do, as you can see here, are different they're part of different codes in the state of Michigan and across the country, as well as uh, putting out more information on how buildings and other maintenance and HVAC and what is acceptable indoor air quality and all of those tools together. And they are very well respected across industries. And if uh, you are an engineer joining us today, you're probably quite familiar with them. Uh, and, and there are some specific issues within MIOSHA where ASHRAE is referenced as one of the standards. The CDC has best practices for indoor air quality, and they're deferring to uh, some of the research and information that ASHRAE is putting together in this space. So that's why it's so, uh, uh, they're such a great resource for us, and we're so happy to have them with us here today. Now, as we get started, if you've been joining me on our Q&A webinar series, we've talked about the hierarchy of safety controls for quite some time. The absolute best thing you can do in the workplace is to eliminate that hazard completely. When you go through these steps of either trying to substitute or change the environment or, or require people to do something differently and you can't get rid of that hazard, you move to PPE. So, you know, in most workplaces uh, with the requirements for COVID, we're doing a myriad of all of these things. And what the general ventilation is going to talk about is changing that environment a bit. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, we're not going to necessarily be able to know or completely eliminate COVID in, in the indoor environment, but these things can help mitigate that. So along with those other strategies, like the distance, the Hello. barriers, and the mass. Oh, Sonia's joined us. All right. Sorry. Yeah, you guys had me muted. 
Yeah, sorry for the technical difficulty, Sonia. I started at the beginning of your slides just to get through some of your preliminaries. I was just talking about the hierarchy of safety controls. I cannot see what slide number that is, but we're on the bar graph right now. And I was just explaining that what we're talking about here is changes to the environment that can help mitigate some of this risk. OK, perfect. So let me just pull up that slide. I apologize. Um, yeah, I was um, <laughs> sending emails to let you know that, that I was muted. But um, so we're on slide seven now. We're talking about the hierarchy of safety controls. Yes. Um, and so I'm sure you're wondering how buildings fit into some of the other things that we're doing to reduce the risks associated with COVID. Um, here in Michigan, as Sean mentioned earlier, we have masked up, right? So we're wearing masks, we're washing our hands often, we're practicing social distancing. On this um, typical OSHA scale of safety controls, those masks, they fall into the category of personal protective equipment. And the hand washing and social distancing, those things fall under administrative practices, right? We're doing things differently. But we can see that there are some other things that we can potentially do as well. Uh, we can also employ some engineering controls. We can use our existing HVAC systems in our buildings to change the indoor environment and improve the odds in our favor. So now let's talk about how we do that. Next slide. Um, first, we want to make sure that we establish our facility management team. We want to make sure that they understand they are being asked to, uh, to put together a pandemic response plan that is specific, achievable, and relevant to your building and your resources in terms of time, money, and people. If you have one, you'll want to review your existing facility operating manual to make sure you understand how you're currently doing things. And then once you determine what changes you're going to make to your operating procedures, you'll want to document them and adequately communicate them to your entire facility team. You want to make sure that the team knows what you're doing and that they're trained on the, any new procedures. You're going to want to monitor and track the impact of your changes so you can see if they're helping, how much they're helping, if they're doing what you wanted, if there are any unintended consequences, and how all of this impacts your facility, your people, and your bottom line. Um, you're going to want to um, also have a set time to revisit the changes that you make and then determine if you need to keep them in place or if you can return to your previous protocols. And you want to be sure that you keep your regular building performance reviews. Or if you don't already do them, you want to begin evaluating on a regular basis the performance of your building. Next slide. Um, the second thing you'll want to do, especially if your building has been dormant, is to make sure that you have appropriate water quality, both for people and for your equipment. Now, this presentation does not address water concerns, but know that there are plenty of resources that do, should you need them. Next slide. Before you begin making any changes to your existing equipment and systems, you want to be sure that everything is working the way it's supposed to. HVAC equipment is often in a basement or on a roof, so it often gets forgotten until it's broken, until it's too hot or too cold. But long before that, it requires regular maintenance. This is the equipment that is largely responsible for maintaining your indoor environment. So if you don't take care of it, it can't take care of you. It's kind of like a car. You can buy an entry level model or you can buy the most expensive thing on the showroom floor. But if you don't change the oil, if you don't flush the radiator, if you don't take the or put gas in, neither one is gonna take you where you wanna go. And a special note here, so you want to make sure that you're maintaining your equipment and you want to pay particular attention to, uh, to those components of your system that may be contaminated, right? Since we're dealing with a virus that can capture components, um, I'm sorry, that um, could be captured by components in the HVAC system, any staff person whose job causes them to be in contact with potentially contaminated things like filters, coils and drain pans, they should be wearing PPE, right? Appropriate PPE, right? Not a handmade mask, but appropriate PPE for the work that they're doing. Next slide. 
um, before you welcome your occupants back into your building, you want to make sure that you've done an airside flush. The building has been dormant for several weeks, and now it's full of old, stale, stagnant air. You want to get that air out of there. To do that, if possible, depending on the capabilities of your equipment, you want to operate the system at 100% outside air mode, or at least long enough to achieve four to eight or more complete air changes. That means you want to have taken all the air currently in the building, gotten rid of it, and brought in new air at least four to eight times. If you can't do that with your existing equipment, then you may also want to consider opening windows and doors or use temporary exhaust fans. After that, you want to operate the building for at least 24 hours, and you want to monitor and track and trend the building performance. Is it able to maintain set points for temperature? Is it meeting your airflow requirements? Is everything working like it should? Does anything need to be adjusted, repaired, or replaced? And then finally, once you're actively using the building, you want to do a daily flush before and after occupancy. You want to try to achieve at least three full air changes. Um, or if you don't know um, whether or not you're getting a full air change, two hours before and after you uh, occupy the building should be sufficient. Um, and this is all to help ensure that that used air that may be contaminated, we've breathed in it, and we've coughed in it, um, but we want to exhaust all of that. And you want to have a good foundation of indoor air of acceptable quality to start off your next occupancy cycle. Next slide. So what do we mean when we say acceptable indoor air quality? Well, ASHRAE defines acceptable air quality as air in which there are no known contaminants at harmful concentrations and with which 80% or more of the people breathing it are satisfied. So where does this air quality come from? Next slide. Well, it comes from us. People come into our spaces and they may be wearing cologne, they may be producing bioeffluence, they may have colds or other viruses that they bring in with them. Our buildings are full of furniture and equipment like desks and carpets and drapes that may be off-gassing some of the chemicals used in their manufacture. We may be performing tasks like welding or woodworking that generate dust. We may be cleaning and have chemical solutions in our spaces. And we come in from outdoors. We've got dirt on our shoes. We open doors that allow in pollen and insects. Next slide. The thing that helps us fight all of these and other sources of pollution is our HVAC system, right? And it's got its work cut out for it. Next slide. There are a number of things that get in the HVAC system's way of providing that acceptable indoor air. Two of the biggest are lack of humidity control and poor maintenance. Many buildings don't have humidity control, because often we don't think it's important and we don't want to pay for that system capability. And we often don't maintain our HVAC systems because we don't budget for it. Or we think, oh, it's just a damper actuator, that little thing, how important could that be? Well, these things are very important. Again, if we don't take care of our HVAC system, it can't possibly take care of us. So now what is it that we're asking this equipment to do? Next slide. When the average person thinks of air conditioning. They often think of just cooling the air, right? But air conditioning is actually much more than that. Um, it includes control for temperature, plus control for humidity, air cleanliness, air motion within the occupied space, and introduction of new air into that space. Today, we're going to talk about three of these air quality characteristics, filtration for cleanliness, humidity, and ventilation. We'll start with ventilation. Next slide. This is the process of supplying air into or removing air from a space for the sole purpose of controlling contaminant levels, humidity, and temperature of that air within that space. Next slide. So this is very important today when we're concerned about viruses being expelled from infected people, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. 
These virus particles are certainly ex they're expelled from our mouths when we cough or when we sneeze, but they're also produced from just plain old talking and breathing. Now, based on physics, the heavier particles, because of their weight, they're going to fall to the floor in a relatively short distance from the infected person. But research has shown that smaller particles can travel as far as 25 or more feet. Right? So this is a concern. We need our HVAC systems to help us ventilate these spaces. Next slide. We need to get rid of that old air that we've breathed and coughed in and bring in some fresh, new, clean air. We call this dilution ventilation because it reduces the concentration of contaminants in the space. And when those concentrations are reduced, so is the probability that somebody else in the facility will get infected. This graph here shows how the probability of others being infected from just one sick person is reduced logarithmically when we increase ventilation rates. Now, it's never going to get to zero, but we can get it down to a reasonable percentage that we're comfortable with, right? And somewhere between, depending on the, what your facility is and how it's being used, uh, somewhere between four and eight air changes per hour may be good for you in, in these conditions. Now, recognize that this graph is a general graph, and it was um, um, it is designed with some specifics uh, in mind for a particular application, looking at a 5,000 square foot space, eight hours of exposure, yada, yada, right? So some, some specific things there. So this may not apply to your facility. Your facility might need more air changes or it might need fewer, right? But we want to look at what your facility requires, right? And we also have to bear in mind, next slide, please. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that this increased ventilation does not come without a price. When we bring in that additional air, it has to be clean, it has to be heated or cooled, it has to be humidified or dehumidified, and then it has to be distributed around the building. That means that the HVAC equipment is going to have to provide more heating or cooling than it had in the past. So we're going to want to know if it has excess capacity. And your, your facility team can help you determine that. Right. Additionally, that extra heating, cooling, and moving around of air is going to require additional energy. So we need to be prepared for higher energy bills, too. Now, if you've recently done any energy efficiency upgrades at your facility, that's a good thing because those can help offset the increase in energy use you'll see from increased ventilation rates. Um, and your HVAC consultants. Uh, can help you find out whether or not uh, you, your existing equipment has the extra capacity that that's needed, and then what that additional energy is likely going to cost you. Next slide. Um, the second concern that we have today that we're talking about is humidity. Now, even though we don't think of humidity unless we're talking about the heat index outside, right, and whether or not we should go cut our grass or play a game of softball, it matters very much in spaces and it matters very much to our bodies, which are more than 60% water. Now, our good health depends on a proper balance of moisture, both inside and outside. In warm environments, when the humidity is really high, we run the risk of overheating, getting cramps, fainting, suffering heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And when the humidity is too low, the mucous membranes in our nasal passages and respiratory tract can't effectively do their job of humidifying and filtering out particles from the air we breathe. Our bodies do well when we drink eight glasses of water a day and we're in environments that are maintained between 40 and 60 percent relative humidity. Now, the creator was looking out for us because in that particular relative humidity range that is ideal for us is not so good for viruses and other contaminants. This graph shows that for the most part, bacteria, mites, fungus, and such prefer relative humidities either below 40% or greater than 60%. And the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19 
is no different, right? So we want to be able to maintain those relative humidities between 40 and 60%. Now, we need to make sure that our equipment, that our system can handle that. Can the ductwork handle that? If we have humidification equipment in the building, does it have the additional capacity to be able to provide that? Now, some facilities, uh, <clears throat> and they may have single pane doors, and so there, or they may be um, a place where a lot of, um, you know, ornate furniture, a, a house of worship, for example. And um, you want to make sure in those spaces that you don't create a problem by increasing your relative humidity. Um, if you've got concerns about condensation in colder environments, then you want to make sure, you, then you may not want to increase your relative humidity to 40 to 60% in the winter time. Maybe you're going to have it around 30%, right? So you want to have um, an HVAC system specialist, some engineers, uh, some consultants that are helping you decide what's right for your facility. Again, everything in this presentation is a generalized um, recommendation just based on um, a recognized in, uh, engineering principles. But each facility is different, each application is different, and we want to make sure that you look at what is needed for your facility. The other way that humidity helps us, next slide please, is that um, when we cough or sneeze, the particles that are coming out of our mouth are pretty big and they have a lot of water with them. And because of this, just by natural physics, they tend to fall to the ground in a relatively short period of time um, and also not far from, from the infected person. Um, and when they're on the ground, of course, they can do us much less harm than when they're up floating in the respirable um, air that we're moving in, right? So, but when the relative humidity is around 20%, the moisture that's coming out of our mouths with these coughs and sneezes that may be in, uh, contain uh, bacteria and viruses and such, that moisture evaporates more quickly and the, what we've expelled gets lighter. Right? It gets lighter and it gets concentrated. So two things happen. One, it hangs out in the air a lot longer. So we can see here from this graphic, if we've coughed out or we've, we've sneezed and we've sneezed out some particles that are 100 micrometers, um, but if we're in a space that has a low humidity, low relative humidity, um, and the, 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 that moisture evaporates and um, the, the particle shrinks down, if you will, to one micrometer or half a micrometer, we can see that that can float possibly in the air 12 hours, 40 hours or more, right? After the infected person is gone, after that sneeze, after that cough, right? So it's very important um, that we ventilate, right? That we get rid of that stale air um, and that we maintain proper humidity levels. Okay, next slide. Um, I'd also like to talk just a little bit about filtration. There's been a, um, a lot of uh, concern and interest about filters and filter MERV level and increasing MERV levels uh, to improve our filtration. Um, so this table here shows uh, the efficiency of various MERV level filters. Now, when we talk about a MERV level, uh, the minimum efficiency reporting value for a particular filter. It's based on the efficiency of that filter removing par particles in three distinct size ranges between 0.3 and 1 micrometers, 1 to 3 micrometers, and then 3 to 10 micrometers. Right? Now, most people, some people are very uh, interested in moving uh, from whatever they have to a, a HEPA filter because when you look at the size of this coronavirus, which is similar to other viruses, right, it's just 0 0.1 micrometer, right? So that's kind of smaller than what typical filters are being rated for anyway. Now, just because they're not necessarily rated for that doesn't mean that they can't remove um, particles of that size, but that's just not how they're rated. Right? So we can see here that as we increase our MERV level, 
uh, we do get better filtration in each of those size range categories. And we can see here in, uh, in the column titled Typical Pollutants, what some of these filters um, typically remove from spaces. Right, so a lot of um, light commercial equipment or residential type equipment might have a filter that's only rated a MERV 6 or MERV 8, right? And this is good for removing dust and maybe some moles, right? Um, but it's not very effective in the 0.3 uh, to 1 micrometer or 1 to 3 micrometer range. And people are interested in looking to, to move to, you know, 13 or 14 or 16 uh, MERV values. And we can see that these are significantly more efficient and they um, are typically used to remove, you know, smoke and, and, and toner fumes and bacteria and that, uh, things of that nature. When we get down to the viruses, we really kind of um, are, are moving toward, uh, more toward the HEPA filters. Um, but the increase in filtration also, just like the increase in humidity and just like the increase in ventilation, also comes with a cost. And that cost is going to be felt in pressure drop, right? These filters add uh, resistance to our uh, HVAC system, specifically to the fan that has to move air through the filter. And as that resistance increases, um, it impacts the ability of the fan to operate. Right? And we can see here that typical pressure drops for the MERV 6 or 8 filter, um, you know, these are going to start off somewhere around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 inches, and they're going to end up around an inch. The MERV 13 um, filter uh, looks at, uh, st starts around, you know, 0 0.3, maybe 0 0.25 inches, and when it's dirty, it's going to be around one inch. Okay, um, the, the HEPA filters, however, you can see significantly higher pressure drop with those filters. So the cost, not only for the filter, is going to be more, right, but the cost in energy use for that type of filter is going to be more as well. And let's see how that's going to play out in our system. Next slide. So when you increase your filtration levels, um, again, it impacts the fan's ability to move air throughout your system. Uh, this graphic here on the left shows the, race, the, the relationship between static pressure of your system and the airflow, the amount of air that you can move through that system. And if we look at the fan curve, we can see that as we increase static pressure, our airflow decreases, right? It gets less. And so if we start off with a system that has some, some MERV-8 filters in it, for example, it's going to have this blue system curve. And that intersection of that system curve and your fan curve is where your fan operates. And that's how much air you're moving through your system. Now, when the filter gets a little dirty, it's going to slide up on that fan curve a bit. Um, as, as much as is, you know, a, a half an inch or, or what have you. It typically tends to double. The, um, the, the starting pressure drop. If you increase to a higher MERV level, it's going to move further up on that fan curve. And you can see here the red, where the red curve um, hits that fan curve, you're moving significantly less air through the system, which means you may not get as much airflow as you need to the spaces in your building. Right. You may be reducing airflow to the building by increasing uh, the, the, the filtration level. So this is something that you want to have um, your facility team definitely take a look at and give consideration to before you just make a carte blanche change uh, to increase the MER value of your filters. A couple of other things that you want to be aware of with uh, increasing um, the MERV value of your filters. Uh, you want to make sure that any increase in, uh, that you do, that the new filters can fit into your equipment, right? If your existing equipment has a one-inch rack and it accommodates a one-inch filter, right, you, make, you want to make sure that if you increase your MERV value that your new filters are also just one inch. Or then you make a decision to modify your equipment to accept either a two-inch filter or a four-inch filter or some other depth of filter. The other thing that you want to think about with filters is the cost of the filter. 
not just the first cost either, because with the higher MER value, the filters are going to be more efficient. You're going to have to change them more frequently. Do you have a person that's going to do that? Who's going to do that? Do you have a budget to pay for the filters and pay for the person that's going to be changing them on a regular basis? Um, and mind you, I'm not suggesting that we don't do this because these are things that need to be done. I'm just suggesting that we consider the whole picture, look at this holistically, and understand that there are definitely impacts to the actions that we may take. Okay, next slide. So just bear in mind that your HVAC system, it is a system. It is a series of components that are designed to work together in, as a single unit. So if you make a change to one part, it's going to have an impact downstream on the rest of the system, possibly upstream as well. Right? So some changes are going to be additive. Some changes are going to be synergistic. They're going to work together. Some of them are not going to impact other things that you do in your system, but some changes are going to be working against one another, right? So just recognize that and be aware of um, how any action you take with this system might impact other components elsewhere in the system. And that includes the, the system's ability to maintain your set points, for temperature, for airflow, for humidity, um, what have you. So just a couple of uh, quick recaps. And I know I went through this relatively quickly, but I want to make sure that hope, uh, you know, and I know that, that Sean said in the beginning, uh, he, he went through a couple of the slides. This is just the beginner presentation. This is just the teaser. Um, and it provides an overview of some of the concerns for, uh, for, for ventilation, for humidity, and for filtration. The next presentations that we'll do in this series will get much more in depth into each of these categories. But let me just kind of do this, this recap here of what we've talked about. Um, so for ventilation, you want to make sure that you're at least meeting uh, the minimum uh, code required ventilation. Um, sometimes, you know, when we, we install our equipment, that equipment lasts, you know, 15, 20 years, and because it's in the roof or on the basement, very often we don't necessarily think about it. We may not do all the maintenance that's necessary. And over time, the performance of that equipment drifts, right? So we want to make sure that we go back and make sure that we are getting what we are supposed to get out of our ventilation system. Are we at, and are we at least meeting code minimum in terms of the, the ventilation levels for each individual space within our building? And the, 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 the required levels vary based on the type and type of your building and what it's used for, right? We want to make sure that we increase um, our outdoor air ventilation to as much as we can, right, without compromising the ability of the equipment to meet our set points, right? Remember that if you bring in additional air, that air has got to be heated and cooled and humidified and then moved around. And that's going to take energy and it's going to take extra capacity. And we want to make sure that when we're bringing in more outside air than we used to bring in in the wintertime, can we still get the building up to 68 degrees, right, or 69 or 70 or whatever your set point happens to be. If you happen to have demand control ventilation in your facility, you may, during this time, wish to disable it, right? Because demand control ventilation is going to reduce the amount of outside air that you bring in based on occupancy. And it's going to be looking at, okay, how, mu how many people are in this space at this particular time and how much outside air do I need to bring in for this number of people? Because we want to increase our ventilation, we want to bring in more outside air. Right, so you want to disable that demand control ventilation, and then you also want to make sure that you've taken steps to avoid air reentrainment. Once you've exhausted dirty, foul, used up air out of your building, you want to make sure that you don't bring that air right back into your building. Next slide humidity control. We want to make sure that we are maintaining our spaces between 40 and 60 percent relative humidity the greatest extent possible. But of course, if we've got concerns about condensation, then we want to look at 30%. Um, at and that 40 to 60% ranges over um, 
over the seasons, right? So in the summertime, you know, you want to keep it around, you're, you're, you're going to be in that 50 to 60% range. In the wintertime, you're going to be in that 40 to 50% range, right? And um, if you don't have the ability to have, or if you currently don't have central humidity equipment in your facility, right, it's not at your air handler, it's not um, in your mechanical room, uh, then consider using in-space equipment. That can either be portable equipment or it could be wall-mounted equipment where you're bringing the, the humidity right to the space where the people are. You want to make sure, though, that for any um, load equipment that you have that's in the space that's not in your central mechanical room, you want to make sure that your facility staff is aware of it, they know that it's there, and that they know it needs to be maintained. The last thing you want to do is bring in um, water for humidity and then have it sit. Right? That creates other problems. On the filtration side, you want to apply the highest MER filter for your, for, for your equipment uh, that is applicable and that is proper for your equipment and your system. Right? Um, and you want to make sure that you have considered all of the cost factors, including the cost of acquiring the filters and maintaining them, changing on a regular basis, right? monitoring them. And again, if you don't have the um, ability to install additional filtration at your central mechanical room, then consider in-space filtration. Uh, there are um, a number of, of, of technologies, uh, UVGI, for example, and other things that you might consider doing in your space, and those will be talked about in detail during the webinar on filtration. Um, wanted to let you know that um, your HVAC system professionals, they are all across the state of Michigan. Um, we have two ASHRAE chapters here in this state, uh, in Metro Detroit and then Western Michigan. And between us, we cover the entire state, Lower Peninsula and Upper Peninsula. There are over 1,000 members of ASHRAE um, working throughout the state. We work for manufacturer representatives. We work for manufacturers. We work for architectural engineering firms. We work for uh, test and balance companies, water treatment specialty companies, uh, energy management companies, and, um, and, and more. Right. So reach out, there is help available. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing here in the state for you um, already is we have, def we have created a, uh, a list of recommendations uh, for HVAC and domestic water systems uh, on the reopening of your facilities. This is a very concise document. It's very simple, easy to read. Um, and it is available uh, on our website. You can download it free from there. If you have any additional questions, uh, you can visit our society page. Um, ASHRAE is an international society, um, and we and our, our web page is located here. We have also um, instituted a special email address dedicated for COVID-19 questions. So if you have a question, you can email it to COVID-19 at ASHRAE.org and someone will respond to your question. We also have up on that on this website a list of frequently asked questions or the responses to frequently asked questions, as well as recommendations for um, various types of buildings. So for office buildings, typical commercial buildings, um, healthcare, uh, schools, things of that nature, whatever your type of building, you can get some additional guidance on, from this website um, on how to handle things. And next slide. Uh, that is the end of my, my presentation. Here are some sources for additional questions. And uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, I think, uh, for questions now. Uh, not quite yet, Sonia. We got one more presenter that we're going to run through. I really appreciate all that information. What a great presentation. I think it's uh, very helpful. As I said at the outset, this can feel very overwhelming, but uh, don't lose site that there are things that you can do and to help uh, us better understand what other resources may be available our friend todd parker the director of programs for michigan saves i'll turn it over to you todd uh, thank you very much sean i appreciate the uh, the chance to be here and, and talk with the uh, the group about um, how these financing improvements might be paid for so if we move to the next slide uh, i can tell you that Michigan Saves is a nonprofit organization dedicated to making energy improvements easy and affordable. And we do this by providing low interest financing for qualifying energy efficiency, renewable energy, and health and safety improvements. 
Uh, since 2010, we have been uh, Michigan's Green Bank and have financed uh, over $270 million worth of uh, equipment upgrades and improvements to residential and commercial facilities throughout the state. So you can see from the graphic there, we kind of sit in that intersection between contractors, customers, lenders, uh, and the, the state and, and utilities uh, around it. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see our commercial financing offerings. We have residential, commercial, and public sector programs. Uh, for our commercial financing programs, $5,000 minimum up to multi-million dollar projects is what we're capable of doing. Our financing is available for all types of businesses, nonprofits, uh, public sector, multifamily buildings. Uh, any, anybody in the state is an entity that we can provide financing for uh, if they need energy efficiency and renewable energy and health and safety improvements. Uh, we have a fast, easy turnkey process for our commercial financing with online applications available and standard rates starting at about 6% APR. However, through our relationships and collaborations with uh, Consumers Energy, DTE, and Semco Energy, customers in those service territories may qualify for 0% financing or 199% financing uh, for certain types of, of energy improvements. And you can find out more information about our commercial financing on the link on the page. Next slide. So as, as Sonia mentioned, there are a lot of uh, improvements that you can make to your HVAC system to improve indoor air quality. And many of these improvements are uh, operational measures that have little to no cost associated with them. Uh, as she noted, you can simply call your HVAC uh, professional, HVAC company that you use. A lot of these, these uh, improvements can be made at that time at very little cost. Uh, for those measures that do require uh, some initial investment, Michigan State is able to provide the financing for those. Uh, you can see on the list here, most of these are, are free, no cost, low cost measures. Uh, the ones that we see a lot of in our normal programs are the uh, fixed, feed, fixed speed fan motors, replacing those with variable speed motors. It's a very common energy improvement that's made that also helps with the uh, operation of the HVAC system. The utilities love to provide rebates for uh, HVAC fan motors, you get great rebates for those improvements. Uh, Michigan State's finance is quite a few of those. Uh, and you'll also note there uh, toward the bottom, we are able to expand into things like the portable room air cleaners with HEPA filters. If that's something that you may need in your facility, uh, Michigan State is an option to finance those as well. And then something that was not mentioned yet, but I'm sure might be mentioned in the future, is the installation of UV technology or disinfecting technology into an HVAC system, either at the coil or within the ductwork. Uh, that UV light deactivates the, the virus uh, and cleans your air as it moves, as it passes by in the ductwork or again at the coil. Uh, one thing to note, however, that uh, if you are increasing outdoor ventilation, you're doing all the other improvements that, that Sonia suggested to bring in more outdoor air, you probably don't need UV technology because you're just going to be cleaning outdoor air at that point. Uh, so consider, think about UV technology if that's a good option for you. And in some cases, it may not be. Uh, if you're able to increase the outdoor uh, ventilation, uh, UV technology may not be your best choice. Uh, but if you can't do a lot of that, you have to uh, recirculate a lot of air, then, then maybe uh, UV technology is a good option for you to look into. Next slide. And while we're on uh, UV technology, there is also an emerging uh, field of UV lights or blue lights as we call them, that you can set up in your space uh, overnight and you can run it and that will uh, disinfect that space as well. Uh, these lights are not that expensive, uh, depending on which models you buy. They are portable. They often have timers, so you can set them uh, to run in the middle of the night to, to disinfect your space. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can find on the web about UV light technology and blue light technology for uh, disinfecting small spaces. As uh, Sonia mentioned, uh, a lot of these improvements that you make are going to increase your electric bills or in your, ga your gas bills in some cases. So please keep that in mind uh, that these health and safety improvements are not necessarily energy efficiency improvements. And then for the UV technology as well, that does require electricity to 
to operate. So if you do invest in those types of systems, expect to see higher electric bills as a result. Uh, the tables that you saw in the last few slides and some other information along with sources and attribution are all available in a short memo that is on the or hit the link at the bottom of the page. If you have any other questions, you can contact us. Uh, I'll be happy to talk with you more about Michigan State's financing and how we can uh, make these improvements and uh, easy and affordable uh, for your business. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate the uh, uh, you being on. I appreciate all of this information. There was a lot of it. I mentioned uh, again, it can get pretty overwhelming as Todd showed you at the end there. And as Sonia mentioned as well, like there's this is a system. So there are small things you can do that will help. There are large things you can do that will help. Some of those are very cost effective where you may not need Michigan Saves to help with financing. Some of those are bigger. So um, this is a very important space that we're trying to navigate as we move into the winter months where humidity drops, indoor usage goes up and trying to navigate that in the COVID crisis. So. Uh, we're going to. Uh, as, I, as we mentioned, we're going to continue with three more parts of the series that are going to focus in on those specific aspects of uh, HVAC systems that Sonia discussed in, uh, in detail. All right, with that, my name is Erica, and I'm going to try to quickly run through the questions that have come through. We've got about 10 minutes left here. Uh, the first one is from Sarah. Do you have a uh, excuse me, do you recommend installing portable HEPA air purifiers in conference rooms? So Sonia, I would try to defer to you on a lot of these questions. I have an answer I can give, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to chime in. Okay, so um, if we need to look at each facility, right, and the capability of that facility, if, the, uh, if there is no way to do that in, um, with the essential, the central station equipment, then yes, putting them in a conference room is an acceptable way, is an, is an acceptable approach. All right, and the next one is from Ed Harris. How would you monitor the changes that you make, such as if a UV or HEPA filter is used, is there a monitor to determine how clean the air is? So the only way to really determine how clean your air is, um, is to, to do an assessment of the facility. Um, and you can certainly do that. There are IAQ specialists that can help you do that. Um, you may want to look at um, some other means of doing that. So for example, um, and you can monitor if you're, uh, you can, for example, monitor other things about the air. You might monitor CO2 levels, right? Um, and try to keep them at a certain level to make sure that you're getting the appropriate or additional ventilation that you want. All right, uh, this question is from Eric. Do you have any definitive reports concerning indoor ionization products regarding effectiveness against viruses included COVID-19? I'm sorry, can you please repeat that? Sure. Do you have any reports concerning indoor ionization products regarding effectiveness against viruses, including COVID-19? Uh, so, as speaking from, from ASHRAE's perspective, um, we don't evaluate um, technology in, in that way. Um, However, I will say that there are a number of studies that have been um, published in recent months um, about the effectiveness of various pieces of equipment. Um, and I would refer you to um, some of the websites, either from, either from ASHRAE or the CDC, for manufacturers on the effectiveness of that equipment. Um, there are also um, just articles in other um, in industry magazines that also address some of the concerns with some of the equipment. Um, you want to make sure that you're not 
us looking at um, how effective is a piece of equipment or a, touch, a particular technology with um, removing or inactivating the virus. You also want to make sure that you look at um, unintended consequences and impacts on people and their health as well. I know that there are some concerns with some of the, the newer technologies that are out there. Um, that's not to say that they're not good or that they uh, shouldn't be used, but just that they should be uh, considered with caution and um, evaluated thoroughly before you make a decision to use uh, them in your facility. All right. Uh, does MyOSHA want businesses to install special systems in HAVA systems to prevent the spread of COVID-19? This is a, a best practice concept. These are things that can help us mitigate that risk, uh, but there is not a specific requirement at this time. If you, some industries do have already have requirements. So if, if you're not one of those, this is uh, general ventilation stuff. There are not changes to those other industries. All right. And according to the University of Pennsylvania, Transmission via airborne aerosols is not supported by epidemiologic evidence outside of known aerosol generating procedures. In other words, breathing alone will not produce airborne aerosols sufficient to spread COVID-19. Is there science that can quantify the value of adding MERV-13 style filters in order to increase safety and stop the spread of COVID-19? I would uh, encourage those folks to go to the ASHRAE resources as well as the CDC and other places that have guidance on indoor ventilation systems, HVAC systems, and the spread of COVID because they reference a lot of these, a lot of the same information that we've discussed today. If I could, I'd like to go uh, backtrack just a little bit to the, the, the question um, about the IAQ monitors. I want to just add a little bit of additional information there. Um, so there are, um, ways that can be, you know, if, with, uh, for example, a, a building automation system or other types of uh, facility control, uh, there are ways to, to monitor IAQ um, on a regular basis and, and get that. And when you talk about IAQ in particular, you're looking at, it's not one thing, you're looking at, for example, various contaminants. You might be looking at, at particles, particle sizes, you might be looking at, at CO2, you might be looking at um, so you, know, you might be looking at other things in the space. And so you can have an IAQ um, monitoring system that looks at the particular contaminant of concern and monitors the concentration and prevalence of that particular uh, contaminant in your facility. So I just wanted to just, just clarify that on the, on the IAQ question. All right. And the next question asks, does not consideration have to be given to what type of population is in the building? For the vast majority of our internal business environments, we are supporting a healthy population uh, that's non-COVID. I'm not sure I understand that question. So I think uh, uh, to try to help answer the question is, you know, if we're in an indoor environment like an office and we have, we're doing health screenings and people are healthy, do we really need to be that concerned? And I think the answer is yes, the asymptomatic spread. And I think um, if you, spend some time with ASHRAE's materials in general, not just as it relates to COVID, you will see that a lot of illnesses and, uh, or not a lot, but many illnesses can be moved around buildings and the indoor air environment has an impact, not only as it relates to COVID, but as it relates to the cold and the flu and other molds and mildews that might be in the space that can cause illness as well. Absolutely, and just because somebody doesn't have COVID doesn't mean that they don't have something else. Um, and, the, and the ventilation is, um, you know, and, and the HVAC equipment and particularly the ventilation and the bringing in of fresh air um, is not just to get rid of, of viruses and other things that can uh, possibly do us harm, but it's also looking at um, other things like odors in the space as well, right? So, you know, things like um, perfumes and, and other things um, uh, can be, are, are also removed uh, when you have good ventilation in your facility. And, and as we mentioned at the outset too, with roughly 40% or so believed to come from asymptomatic people, these are folks that would easily get past the health screening because they, they're fine. Um, so that, you know, while it seems uh, healthy with COVID, something we can't see, smell, or touch, 
uh, it can be in the workplace. Absolutely. All right. Uh, this one's from Ed Harris. Suggestions for OAQ sensors or IAQ? I'm sorry. Uh, is that OAQ and IAQ? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. So you're, 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 you have concern for both, right? Your indoor environment is the environment that you're trying to control. Um, but certainly when you talk about ventilation and bringing in fresh air into the building, uh, there, sometimes that air is air that has been used in the building already and is being, has been cleaned and is being recirculated. But very often, most often, that air is coming from outside, what we call fresh air or outdoor air. So if your facility is in a is in a is located in a place where you have concerns about the quality of the outdoor air, then it absolutely makes sense to um, to add outdoor air quality sensors as well. All right. Well, um, I apologize we weren't able to get to all the questions, but we are out of time for today's event. So we will make sure this material is available uh, via email to those who attended. And with that, I leave it to Sean to close us out. Thanks, Erica. Thanks for those wonderful questions. Just a huge thank you to Sonia and Ashray and Todd and Michigan Saves. This is critical information as we congregate indoors more and more as it gets colder here in Michigan. I think we need to be aware that this virus is real. It's it's spreading. There are ways that we can help mitigate this risk. These are important factors to make sure that we coupled with those other mitigation factors we've been talking about with the masking and capacity limits and stuff to ensure that as we all do start getting indoors more and more that we're continuing to contain COVID as much as we can in Michigan uh, and we don't allow our workplaces or our businesses to become a source of uh, contaminating our community. So we appreciate you taking the time. Please make sure you check in as we dive in a little bit deeper into each of these components that we've discussed. Um, think small. You can take small steps to do a lot in this space. So don't feel like you have to do it all. Use these resources we've provided and, you know, thanks for checking back in with us.